This is Space Time, Series 21, Episode 87, for broadcast on the 2nd of November, 2018. Coming up on Space Time, the origins of the Martian moon Phobos, China to launch an artificial moon, and Rocket Lab selects Wallops Flight Facility for its US launch site. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. A new study claims the Martian moon Phobos may have been created out of ejected debris blasted out into space when a large asteroid slammed into the red planet soon after it formed. The findings, reported in the Journal of Geophysical Research, adds to a decades-long debate between astronomers about the origins of the tiny Martian moons Phobos and Deimos. The findings are based on a fresh look at 20-year-old data from NASA's Mars Global Surveyor mission, which suggests that the composition of the larger Martian moon Phobos is far more similar to that of the red planet's crust than previously thought. The problem arose because in visible light, both Martian moons look much darker than Mars, leading to the hypothesis that they were captured asteroids. Scientists can study the mineral composition of celestial objects by breaking down the light they reflect into component colours, creating distinctive visual fingerprints. So, by comparing the spectral fingerprints of planetary surfaces to a library of spectra for known materials, scientists can infer the composition of these distant objects. Most of the research into the composition of asteroids has examined their spectra in visible and near-infrared light. And this suggests that Phobos and D-class asteroids look much the same, That is, both their spectra are nearly featureless because they're so dark. D-class asteroids are nearly black as coal because, like coal, they contain carbon. This dark aspect of Phobos led to the hypothesis that the Moon is a captured asteroid, one that flew just a little bit too close to Mars and was captured by the red planet's gravity. However, other scientists, looking at the orbital dynamics of the Martian moons, have argued they could not have been captured and must instead have been formed at the same time as Mars, or as the result of a massive collision on the planet during its formative period. In fact, given the inclination and other details of Phobos's orbit, it seems almost impossible that they were captured. So, the study's lead author, Tim Glotch, from Stony Brook University in New York, decided to try and solve the issue by observing Phobos using the mid-infrared range. He looked at the heat signatures of Phobos captured in 1998 by an instrument aboard the Mars Global Surveyor. Glotch and colleagues then compared the mid-infrared signature of Phobos to samples of a meteorite that fell to Earth near Targish Lake in British Columbia, which some scientists have suggested is a fragment of a D-class asteroid. In the lab, they subjected their samples to Phobos-like conditions in cold vacuum, heating them from above and below to simulate the extreme changes in temperature from the sunny to the shady sides of airless objects in space. They found that the Tuggish Lake meteorite looked nothing like Phobos at these wavelengths. Instead, mid-infrared Phobos most closely matches the ground-up volcanic basalt rock which comprises much of the Martian crust. Glott says the findings lead him to believe Phobos might be an agglomeration of debris from the planet and the remains of an impacting object that slammed into Mars early in its history. Phobos is currently orbiting about 6,000 kilometres above the Martian surface and is dropping by about a metre in altitude every 50 years. Large cracks are now visible on the surface of the 11-kilometre-wide moon, clear evidence that Phobos is now reaching its Roche limit and is slowly being torn apart by the red planet's gravitational tidal forces. Based on its current rate of degradation in about 30 to 50 million years' time, Phobos will be no more, having instead been transformed into a ring of dusty, rocky debris orbiting Mars. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. China has announced plans to launch the first of three artificial moons designed to be bright enough to replace street lighting. If all goes to plan, the three moons will be in orbit by 2022, with the first launching in two years. They'll be shining down on the city of Shenzhou, the capital of the southwestern Sichuan province, saving around $240 million annually in power costs. 
The satellites will be coated in a highly reflective mirror-like material and be placed in 500 kilometer high orbits, from where they'll provide about eight times the brightness of the real moon, about a fifth the brightness of normal streetlights. A report in the Beijing-controlled People's Daily claims the artificial moons will reflect their illumination, providing a dusk-like glow over an area of roughly 10 to 80 kilometres. The artificial moons can be manoeuvred in orbit so that the area being illuminated can be changed to meet requirements, such as areas experiencing power blackouts. There are, however, concerns that the artificial moons will affect wildlife, especially nocturnal animals and they'll also impact both atmospheric and astronomical scientific research. The idea of an artificial moon lighting up the night isn't new. Back in 1999 on Spacetime's predecessor Star Stuff, we reported on the launch of a 25-metre space mirror as part of an attempt by Moscow to provide sunlight to sun-deprived northern Russian cities. However, the mirror failed to unfurl, and instead ended up burning up during atmospheric re-entry. In more recent times, New Zealand's been somewhat more successful in this sort of endeavour, when earlier this year, Rocket Labs launched an electron rocket carrying the humanity star Mirrorball into orbit. To find out more, Andrew Dunkley is speaking with astronomer Dr Fred Watson. Being reported by the um, highly credible source, the BBC, and probably several others, that a Chinese company has announced ambitious plans to put a fake moon into space to brighten the night sky. This is a country yeah. that is blanketed in pollution. <laughs> so well, that's true. one wonders if that's the reason. But um, are they for real? It sounds a bit like a beat-up, uh, really. The orbital mechanics of this sort of thing don't always work the way you might think they do. But let's tell you what we know. And yes, the BBC is one of a number of outlets that have reported this. But it, it's actually coming from an article in the People's Daily, the state newspaper itself in China. Oh, well, that's true. Um, which reports that uh, there's a, an aerospace institute in the city of Chengdu, which has announced plans that they want to launch illumination satellites by 2020 that are bright enough to replace street lights it's Gee, <laughs> the that's, BBC. that's a big call however the yeah. russians did do this they tried it but it didn't work oh, uh, <laughs> i thought they had some success uh, yeah i thought well maybe they did but i think it only lasted half an hour or something like that to say outright that launching anything like that that is designed to illuminate the earth's surface immediately raises questions about light pollution and things of that sort which is very much an area of growing concern among well everybody not just astronomers but the medical profession biologists botanists people worried about insects being fooled into not pollinating crops and all of that sort of stuff uh, that is all now part of the problem of the issue of light pollution. So it's bound to create a lot of raised eyebrows, but it's not straightforward. I like the BBC's comment, which says the following, the straight out of sci-fi news has sparked fascination, scepticism from scientists, lots of questions and outright mockery. Mm -hmm. So that kind of more or less sums it up. It's apparently a person who is the chairman of a company called the Chengdu Aerospace Institute Microelectronic System Research Institute Company Limited. That's their name. So there's two institutes in there, which is pretty interesting. But the chairman is a gentleman by the name of Wu Cheng Feng. And he says, basically, that there's been a lot of tests on the idea of putting some sort of mirror in orbit in order to illuminate the surface of the Earth in the area of Chengdu. Now, of course, you can't just do it with one mirror because you need several in order to provide any kind of constant coverage. You know that at the height of 500 kilometres, which is what they're talking about, mm. that means that you've got an orbital period around the Earth of something like 90 minutes. So the spacecraft only passes over your the area that you're interested in for a very short time. It's overhead for, you know, maybe five minutes at the most, and then you've got to wait for it to come around again. You can do it, actually, in such a way 
There are certain orbits, they're called sun-synchronous orbits, where the spacecraft passes overhead at more or less the same time each day. But it's still very messy. You're not sort of floating something in the in space that is always going to be beaming radiation down to the Earth. The only way you could do that, of course, would be to put it in a geostationary orbit, yes. like the satellites are. But that's at a height of 36,000 kilometres. And can imagine the size of the mirror you'd need to get any sort of light back from that sort of distance, spacecraft at that distance virtually invisible except with very large telescopes. Oh, I know they could use my wife's makeup mirror. It's enormous. Um, I'm not going to go there, Andrew. Uh, and I don't think you should either. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> um, uh, but, uh, I mean, you, uh, yeah, we're, we're mocking it a bit and all the news outlets are having a bit of fun with it. And I do love the caption on the photo of the moth that says, has anybody thought what another moon would mean for moths? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that sounds like a line straight out of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. It's beautiful, yeah. actually. But theoretically, this is possible. Uh, it's possible to do it, but it doesn't really kind of solve the problem. You know, you, you're never going to have something that will mimic the moon. The moon's at a distance of 380,000 kilometres and behaves in a very straightforward way. Mm. But the idea of using something in low Earth orbit doesn't really work. You're quite right about the Russians having tried it. That was in low Earth orbit. And the idea was to beam a, a light spot down to Earth. Of course, that light spot travels across the Earth's surface at the orbital speed, which is eight kilometres per second. And then this thing, well, I don't think it it actually worked terribly well. It did blind a kid on a bike who fell into a ditch and killed a deer. There's probably something like that, yes. I don't uh, think so. <laughs> um, you, but, you know, I suppose the nearest realistic thing that we've got to this, and I'm sure you've seen these, there has been in orbit for a, a number of years, well over a decade, a fleet of spacecraft called Iridium. And the Iridium spacecraft, I think there were 66 of them, they're communication spacecraft, they're in a fairly low orbit, but each one has three antennas on it which basically are polished mirrors they're like l large wardrobe mirrors and they're all angled downwards and when one of these things catches the light of the sun and reflects it down to where you're standing on the earth you see a spot of light which is probably a thousand times brighter than the planet venus it is very bright wow. for a brief period of time a matter of a couple of seconds and so it's been a bit of a hobby among sky watchers to look up in the tables and it's, it was very easy to find when there will be what's called an iridium flare and go outside with some unsuspecting mates and say just look up there and in Instantly, you know, this thing appears and flashes by. It's very impressive when you mm. see the... You um, see the effect when you're flying and you look down and you see down, glints see, of light coming back right. at you that's reflected, you know, the sun <laughs> reflecting off water or something water, like that, yeah. or glass. And things. That's right. Mm. It's the same sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, with the iridium flares, it was really quite spectacular. Of course, it, this was in the darkness. Those iridium spacecraft are now being replaced. And I think very soon there won't be any of those original iridium spacecraft left. And the new ones that have replaced them don't have the reflective mirrors. So that little hobby has now gone by the board. But that was an example of this kind of thing, of reflecting light spots down on the surface. It was of... fun for geeks for a while, wasn't it? Yes, that's right. Yeah. That's... Now, they're so... talking about this mission launching in 20... 2020 and uh, are we taking it with a grain of salt that it probably won't happen i my guess is it won't happen mm. um i think if it got anywhere near there would be sort of major public outcries there's already a quote on the bbc webpage from john barantine a chap that we know quite well who's uh, with the international dark sky association and he's basically saying it's a bad idea yeah. uh, as you'd expect because it's like pollution and you can't you know it's, it's you can't control it it's hard to see how it works how it would work and it's certainly hard to see how it would save street lighting which is what they're saying it will the China Daily, the quoted uh, Mr. Wu, the gentleman who was the chairman of this company, saying if you could illuminate an area of 50 square kilometres, you could save something like 173 million US dollars a year in electricity charges. But of course you can't, because you can only do it for a short time. It's, um, it's probably cost not... you 173 million dollars to send the thing up there anyway. You well, yeah, yeah. That's right. So uh, we'll wait and see. We will wait and see what happens. That's Dr. Fred Watson, an astronomer with the Department of Science, speaking with Andrew Dunkley on our sister program, Space Nuts. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. New Zealand-based orbital launch provider Rocket Lab says it will construct its planned United States launch pad at NASA's Wallops Flight Facility on the Virginian Mid-Atlantic coast. 
The new facility will add launch capacity for the company's Electron rocket, which currently operates from a single launch pad at the Mahaya Peninsula on the east coast of the New Zealand North Island. The Mahaya Launch Complex is licensed to carry out up to 120 commercial flights per year. The new Wallops Island Launch Complex will serve both US government and commercial operations, undertaking a new mission every month. The facility will include a dedicated launch pad and fueling infrastructure, as well as a specialised launch vehicle integration and assembly facility capable of working in up to four Electron rockets at a time. The Electron is a two- or three-stage expendable orbital launch vehicle designed to carry small satellites and CubeSat payloads up to 225 kilograms into low Earth orbit. The 17-metre-tall rocket uses RP-1 kerosene and liquid oxygen propellants and oxidizers, supplying nine electric pump-fed 3D-printed Rutherford first-stage rocket engines and a vacuum-modified Rutherford second-stage engine. The optional third-stage kick motor uses a monopropellant-powered 3D-printed Curry engine designed to circularise payload orbits. The Electron achieved its first successful launch in January, carrying CubeSats for Punnett Labs and Spire Global, as well as the Humanity Star passive satellite we mentioned earlier, a one-metre diameter geodesic sphere designed to glint in the night sky like a disco mirror ball, but without the doof-doof sound. The Electron's next launch, which has been delayed three times since April due to a couple of motor controller issues and a problem with a Chatham Island ground tracking station, is slated for this month. We'll keep you informed. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. And time now to turn our eyes to the skies and check out the celestial sphere for November on Skywatch. November is the 11th and penultimate month of the year in both the Julian and Gregorian calendars. High in the northern skies this time of year, you'll see the constellation Pegasus, the Mesopotamian and Etruscan mythical winged horse who was born from the blood of Medusa the Gorgon after she was slain by Perseus. The brightest star in Pegasus is the orange supergiant Epsilon Pegasi, located some 690 light years away. It's estimated to have about 12 times the sun's mass and about 185 times its radius. Epsilon Pegasi, together with the stars Markab, Algeneb, Sheet, and Alpha Andromedae, form the astrium or pattern of stars known as the Great Square of Pegasus, a bunch of bright naked eye stars which are shaped like a square. One of the stars in the constellation is 51 Pegasi. This was the first star system beyond the Sun that was confirmed to have an exoplanet. Also visible in Pegasus is the globular star cluster M15, also known as NGC 7078. This spectacular jeweled ball is located some 33,600 light years away. Globular clusters are tight balls containing thousands of stars, which were originally all formed at the same time in the same molecular gas and dust cloud. M15 is estimated to be around 12 billion years old, making it one of the oldest known globular star clusters. It contains an estimated 100,000 stars, making it one of the most densely packed globular clusters in the Milky Way. Its core has undergone a contraction known as core collapse, and it has a central density cusp with an enormous number of stars surrounding what may be a central black hole. M15 also contains at least 112 variable stars, 8 pulsars, including one double neutron star system, and the first ever planetary nebula found in a globular cluster. Now, if you're away from city lights, you may notice a fuzzy patch of light right next to Pegasus. This is the giant spiral galaxy of M31 in Andromeda. Andromeda is the biggest galaxy in our local group. That's the group which includes the Milky Way. It's located about 2.5 million light years away. Andromeda contains more than a trillion stars. That's twice the number of stars the Milky Way contains. And it's physically thought to be larger as well, about 220,000 light years across. The Milky Way and Andromeda galaxies are expected to collide with each other in about 3.7 to 4.5 billion years from now, in the process merging to form a giant new elliptical galaxy. Based on current observations, Andromeda appears to have more older stars than the Milky Way. It also has far less new star production than our galaxy and the rate of supernovae in the Milky Way is also about double that of Andromeda. Andromeda is also surrounded by a large and massive halo of hot gas that's estimated to contain about half the mass of stars in the galaxy. This nearly invisible halo stretches about a million light years from the galaxy, almost halfway to the Milky Way. 
If you get a chance to study Andromeda, do so. Even a good pair of binoculars or a backyard telescope should allow you to see the dark dust lanes in Andromeda's spiral arms. And in the middle of all that is its central bright galactic core. OK, continuing our tour of the night skies, and let's move to the east and slightly south of Pegasus, where you'll see the ancient constellation of Cetus, the great whale or sea monster. Beta Ceti, or Deneb Katos, is the brightest star in the constellation Cetus. It's an orange giant, located just 96 light years away. By the way, the name Deneb Katos, well, it means the whale's tail. One of the other stars in Cetus is Myra. This was the first variable star ever discovered. Located some 420 light years away, Myra pulsates in brightness over a period of around 332 days, changing in diameter from about 400 to 500 times the diameter of the Sun. Alpha Ceti, traditionally called Menkar the Nose, is a red-hued giant star some 220 light years away. It's actually a double star system, with a secondary, 93 Ceti, being a blue-white star some 440 light years away. Gamma Ceti, or Kafal Jemar, the head of the whale, is another double star system. The primary is a yellow star 82 light years from Earth, while the secondary is a blue star. At 11.9 light years, the yellow dwarf Tau Ceti is the nearest sun like star to the Earth other than the Sun. Now, turning south of Cetus, you'll see the brilliant star Akamar, which means the river's end, as it marks the end of the river Eridanus. Akamar is a binary system. The two components are designated Alpha Aridne A and Alpha Aridne B and are located some 139 light years away. Of the ten brightest stars in the night sky, Alpha Aridne is the hottest and bluest in colour, being a spectral type B main sequence star. Main sequence simply means it's burning hydrogen in its core. The secondary star is a smaller spectral type A white star, which orbits the primary at a distance of just 12 astronomical units. An astronomical unit is the average distance between the Earth and the Sun, which equates to about 150 million kilometres, or just over 8 light minutes. If you follow Eridanus or Eridanus towards the east, you'll find Orion, a familiar signpost in the southern summer skies. To the west of Orion is the constellation of Taurus the Bull, and located in Taurus is M1, the Crab Nebula. It's the remnant of a star which Chinese astronomers saw explode as a supernova back on July the 4th in the year 1054. Back then, they recorded the sudden appearance of a new star in their sky charts at the exact position of the Crab Nebula. The supernova appeared brighter than the planet Venus for weeks on end before finally fading from view after almost two years. The Crab Nebula is about 7,000 light years away and it's expanding at a rate of around 5 million kilometres per hour. At the heart of the nebula is a rapidly spinning neutron star or pulsar, rotating at some 30 pulses per second. It's emitting radiation in all wavelengths, from gamma rays and X-rays through ultraviolet, optical and infrared and onto radio waves. Observations indicate the pulsar is slowing down, and it will fall to just half its current rate of rotation within the next thousand years. November is also a good time to check out the Pleiades or Seven Sisters, one of the nearest open star clusters to Earth. Depending on whose measurements you prefer, the Pleiades are between 118 and 137 parsecs away, a parsec being about 3.26 light years. Also known as M45, the Pleiades are located in the constellation Taurus and are composed mostly of hot blue young stars. Amazingly, different cultures in vastly different parts of the world all describe the Pleiades as seven sisters or seven women, possibly as the result of some ancient throwback to early human civilization. Probably the best cometary display this year will be C45P with Tannin, which will zoom through the southern skies on its regular 5.4-year orbit, becoming visible to the unaided eye around November the 23rd. It's worth keeping an eye out for. Just like October, November will see three meteor showers. There's the November Orionids, the Taurids and the Leonids. Although peaking in late October, the Orionids are continuing to sprinkle down during the start of November, and they're usually best seen in the wee small hours before dawn. The Orionids are generated by the debris trail left behind by the comet Halley, and they appear to radiate out of the direction of the constellation Orion the Hunter, hence their name. The Taurids are generated by the comet Enki, and as their name suggests, they appear to radiate out of the constellation of Taurus the Bull. 
both Enki and the Taurids are believed to be the remnants of a much larger comet which disintegrated over the past 20 to 30,000 years, breaking into several pieces and releasing material through normal cometary activity and maybe just occasionally through close encounters with the gravitational tidal forces of the Earth and other planets. In fact, this cometary stream of material which forms the Taurids is the largest in the inner solar system. Being so spread out, the Earth takes several weeks to pass through it, causing an extended period of meteor activity, compared to the much smaller periods of activity in other showers. These interactions have, with help of Jupiter, caused the Taurids to be segmented into separate northern and southern streams. The southern Taurids usually runs from around September the 25th to November the 25th, while the northern Taurids goes from October the 12th through to December the 2nd. The Taurids are also quite diffuse, usually only producing about 7 meteors an hour. However, they're composed of more massive material, pebbles instead of dust grains, and so they tend to produce a high percentage of very bright meteors known as fireballs, the result of larger meteoroids burning up through the atmosphere. The southern Taurids should put on their best show just after midnight on November the 5th. Finally, there's the Leonids meteor shower. It'll peak around November the 18th, usually producing up to 15 meteors per hour. However, it has been known to occasionally produce some spectacular meteor storms, with the showers in 1999, 2001 and 2002 producing up to 3,000 meteors per hour. Even more spectacular, the Leonid's meteor shower of 1966 generated thousands of meteors a minute, falling virtually like illuminated rain. The Leonids are usually picked up after midnight, with peaks occurring just before dawn. Produced by the debris trail from the comet Temple Tuttle, the Leonids radiate out from the constellation of Leo the Lion. The Leonids are also a fast-moving stream, which encounter the path of the Earth at some 72 km per second. Larger Leonids, which are about 10 mm across, can have a mass of half a gram and are known for generating very bright meteors. In fact, the annual Leonid's meteor shower may deposit up to 13 tons of particles across the planet. OK, let's turn to planetary matters, and the Moon is in a waning crescent after reaching last quarter on November the 1st. Right now, it'll rise around 2am, about four hours before the Sun, and the new Moon will take place on November 8th. The planet Mercury has recently passed behind the Sun at superior solar conjunction and won't become visible until a quarter to eight in the evening, just after the Sun sets, appearing above the western horizon and lasting about two hours before sinking from view. Venus recently passed in front of the Sun at inferior solar conjunction, and so it's a daytime object right now, reaching just a couple of degrees above the horizon, but virtually impossible to see because of the Sun's glare. On the other hand, Mars will be spectacular, it recently passed opposition and remains easily visible in the evening sky as the sun sets, remaining observable for around six hours before setting just below the western horizon. Jupiter, the king of planets, will soon pass behind the sun at solar conjunction. The gas giant will be visible high in the western evening sky after sunset, remaining observable for a couple of hours before disappearing over the horizon. Our other gas giant, the ringed world of Saturn, will also soon pass behind the Sun at solar conjunction, appearing in the western sky only as the Sun's light fades and setting shortly before midnight. Now, once again, because most of our listeners are in the Southern Hemisphere, most of those are in Australia, and most of those are on the East Coast, all these times and locations are being given for Australian Eastern Daylight Time, for regions around Sydney's longitude. But now we turn to two objects which can be seen pretty well at the same time everywhere on the planet right now. They are the two ice giants, Uranus and Neptune. You'll need a decent telescope to see them, but it's well worth the sight. Uranus was at opposition last month, and it's observable in the east from around 8.30 in the evening until it sets in the west just after half past three in the morning. Neptune is also observable in the early evening, becoming visible in the east around 8.30 and setting below the western horizon just before 2am. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from spacetimewithstuartgary.com, or from your favourite podcast download provider. 
Space Times also broadcasts coast to coast across the United States on Science 360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C. and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 